front-end alignment consists of three major elements. These elements are caster, camber, and toe. The effect of caster stabilizes the steering by causing the front wheels to line up in the direction of travel. Camber is used to direct most of the vehicle's weight onto the larger inner front wheel bearing and to place the point of pivot of the tire as near the center of tread width as possible. Toe is used to compensate camber angle to limit tire wear. Now, let's take a look at our front suspension and see what these three elements look like. This is a head-on view of our visual aid indicator. Take note that it is vertical being perpendicular from the floor. If we look beyond the indicator, we'll notice that the center of the lower ball joint, the center of our spindle, and the center of the upper ball joint are all in line with this indicator. This would dictate a zero caster condition. As we move our upper ball joint behind the spindle toward the rear of the car, this would be typical of a positive caster condition. Consequently, moving the ball joint forward ahead of the spindle will indicate a negative caster condition. We're going to now move the control arm first to the positive, then the negative condition, and you will see the change in relationship between the spindle and the upper ball joint through our vertical indicator. In this view, we'll notice that the relationship between our vertical indicator and the upper ball joint has changed. The ball joint is now to the rear of the car, indicating that it is behind the spindle center line as shown by the indicator. This shows a positive caster condition. Consequently, the opposite is also true. With the upper ball joint moved forward by pivoting the upper control arm on its mounting studs with the shims, we can now clearly see that the upper ball joint is ahead of the spindle by reference to our vertical indicator. This would dictate a negative caster condition. In this view, our visual aid indicator is now perpendicular to the floor in this attitude. We have added a level to our indicator to clarify this. In this condition, we're indicating the fact that our spindle is now parallel with the floor. In this position, we'd be in a state of zero camber. If we move our upper control arm in toward the center of the car, it'll raise the outside of the spindle up. We'll see under indicators that this would dictate a negative camber condition. Consequently, by moving the upper control arm out away from the center of the vehicle, it'll move the outside end of our spindle down, and this would indicate a positive camber condition. As we move the control arm to a negative condition and then a positive condition, you'll see the change on in our indicator and level. In this position, our indicator tells us the spindle's moved up on the outer end, which indicates negative camber. The opposite is also true. Moving the upper ball joint out from the center line of vehicle, we have dropped the end of our spindle down, and our indicator shows we're in a positive camber condition. To understand toe, let us assume that this indicator represents the longitudinal center line of our vehicle. To experience zero toe condition, the length of our spindle will be perpendicular to this center line. If our spindle is less than 90 degrees from the rear center line of the car, we'll be experiencing toe out. With the spindle being less than 90 degrees to our front center line, we'll be experiencing a positive toe condition or toe in. Right now, we're at a zero toe condition. We're perpendicular to center line. 
This would indicate an extremely towed out condition. Consequently, this is an exaggerated toe in condition. After assembly is complete, we'll then show you how to square the steering linkage, set toe, and set adequate camber alignments so that you can safely drive your vehicle to a shop for a final alignment. With the vehicle back on the floor, we want to roll the vehicle back and forth several times while pushing up and down on the bumper to settle the suspension. Once the suspension is settled in, we can check our camber. To check our camber, we're going to take a level, use it as a straight edge across the face of the tire, and read the bubble. We want this reading to be as close to zero as possible. If we're not at zero, we want to adjust our reading by the addition or removal of shims in the upper control arm. If at all possible, we want to add or remove the same amount of shims on both the front and rear attaching bolts of the upper control arm simultaneously. Once we have arrived at a near zero reading, our camber is satisfactory for this initial alignment. Now we can proceed to check and adjust our toe. To square the steering linkage, we must measure from the center of the pitman shaft to the relay rod at the end of the idler arm, and then from the idler arm shaft center across to the pitman arm end of the relay rod. Once these dimensions are identical, the steering linkage is said to be in square. Now we must mark this relationship on our steering shaft and the steering box. With the steering linkage measured square, we want to put reference marks on the steering shaft and the steering box. These marks should be in alignment while setting toe. Notice the mark that's moving has been applied to the steering shaft from the steering wheel, and the fixed mark is on the steering box. Once again, these marks should be in alignment while toe is being set. In order to check and set toe, first, using a, your floor jack, lift the tire off the ground just high enough so the tire can turn freely. We want to use the jack under the lower control arm so as not to upset the suspension travel any more than necessary. Next, we need a scribing jig. To do this, we've taken a 2x6, drilled a hole, and inserted a sharp pick. This will allow us to put the tool in this position while engaging the tire with a sharp end and accurately mark our tire. By marking the tire, we're actually referencing a line that is perpendicular to the spindle. We move the tool into place and engage it lightly in the tire, hold it tightly in place, and slowly rotate the tire. This will scribe an accurate line all the way around the full circumference of the tire. To make sure you've done an adequate job, remove the tool, rotate the tire, and make sure that your line runs true and doesn't wobble back and forth. Now we need to repeat this procedure on the other front wheel. With both tires scribed and the vehicle back on the ground, we now need to resettle the front end the same way we did while doing the camber check, with one change. While settling the front end in, we also need to realign the marks on our steering shaft and steering box. Once this is complete, we can now accurately check and set our toe. To measure the toe, we must measure the distance between the left and front tires on the scribe line in the front and the rear of the tires. We also want to measure the tires at the same height from the floor. To do this, we're using these cans or any similar device of equal height. Now we just need a tape measure and actually measure the distance between the scribe lines at the height of the cans. 
After recording the dimension between the front of the tires on the scribe lines, we must repeat the procedure on the rear of the tires and compare the front and rear readings. If the rear reading is longer than the front reading, we are in a state of toe-in. In other words, the front of the tires are closer together than the rear of the tire. If the opposite is true, the rear reading is less than the front reading, we're in a state of toe-out. Regardless of toe-in or toe-out, we want to adjust the front end till we arrive at zero or approximately 1 16th toed in for this initial alignment. We adjust the difference in toe by turning the adjusting sleeves on our inner and outer tie rod assemblies. We want to make changes to both tie rod assemblies at the same time in equal proportions. When we've arrived at our desired toe, we know we've done the job correctly when both tie rods are almost exactly the same overall length while our steering is squared on our reference marks. Also, between each adjustment of the tie rods, we must resettle the front end back in to allow the adjustments to take effect. Before driving off, there are six point checklists you must run through. One, make sure that the upper control arm to chassis mounting points are tight. Two, that you did your final tightening on your upper control arm shaft nuts. Three, lower control arm to chassis bolts should be thoroughly tightened. Once again, the upper and lower control arms should be final tightened with the vehicle at ride height. Four, the adjusting sleeve clamps on both tie rods should be final tightened. Five, all cotter pins should be installed. Six, all pivots should be lubricated. The Chrysler torsion bar suspension varies in many ways from the double A arm suspension we've just been working on. One of the obvious differences is the construction of the lower control arm, which is actually consisting of two major components, that being the actual lower control arm and the strut rod that reinforces it and helps maintain its location in the vehicle. Looking at the lower control arm from the rear of the vehicle, we'll notice another major difference in this type of suspension, the torsion bar. The torsion bar takes the place of the coil spring that we looked at in our previous suspension. It controls the weight of the vehicle by preloading from a tension screw and the twisting action brought upon it by the upward and downward travel of the control arm. That is why the torsion bar is mounted to the center pivot of the lower control arm. The rear of the torsion bar is mounted in a fixed socket in a cross member further back in the chassis. The last major difference in this type of suspension is the fact that the upper control arm adjust caster and camber through eccentric cams instead of shims. To remove the torsion bar, we must first raise the vehicle, supporting it with a pair of safety stands, remove the shock absorber, which allows the lower control arm to drop a little further, removing tension, back off on the tension screw, making sure that we count and record the number of turns necessary to remove all the rest of the tension from the torsion bar. Once this has been accomplished, we remove the retaining clip from the rear of the torsion bar and slide it through the rear of the car out of the lower control arm socket. Now the remainder of the front suspension can safely be removed from the vehicle. The early Chevrolet Nova suspension, pictured here, is almost identical to that of the early Ford Mustang. They are both very similar in component structure to that of the Chrysler torsion bar suspension in that they share the lower strut, strut rod, and upper A-arm. However, they vastly differ due to the fact that they use a coil spring over the upper control arm instead of the torsion bar which worked off the inner pivot of the lower strut. The Chevrolet also differs in that camber is adjusted using an eccentric cam on the lower strut inner pivot, 
and caster is adjusted by use of a threaded strut rod. The Ford Mustang suspension uses shims on the upper control arm to adjust caster and camber. To safely remove the coil spring from this type of suspension, we first must remove the shock absorber and the steel framework. Once that is removed, we can install the proper type spring compressor, which in this instance is an external type that's made up in two units. We compress the spring just enough to relieve all its tension from the mountings and remove it from the vehicle, after which the remainder of the suspension components can be removed, rebuilt, and reinstalled. Third generation Camaros, Firebirds, and Mustangs all share the same type of front suspension. These suspensions are similar to the double A-arm coil spring type suspension in that they use a lower A-arm and a coil spring which works with the lower A-arm. It differs in that it uses a strut shock absorber in place of the upper control arm and that caster and camber is adjusted by moving the top of the strut. On this type of suspension you can use either an external or internal spring compressor. A final word on safety. If you are not familiar with jacking and supporting a vehicle, always refer to the owner's manual or shop manual for the vehicle that you're going to work on for this information. Always use supports that were designed specifically for this type of work and use them in pairs. And by no means ever substitute these supports with things like cinder blocks or stacks of wood. Also, don't forget to final tighten all fasteners and make sure all cotter pins have been installed before driving off for your final alignment. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you down the road.